Hi there, you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast with your host, me, Simon Drew. If you'd like to listen to over 200 episodes that were recorded before 2020, then you can head to my Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew. We'd love to have you there and any support is greatly appreciated. We'd love to also have you on our Facebook community, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But for now, enjoy the show. Hi there, my name's Simon Drew and welcome to The Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, today, I'm really excited for you to hear this interview that I've done with our good friend, Sharon LaBelle. Now, many of you remember the interview that I did with her uh, about a year and a half ago, and that is still available on our Patreon page. So just go to patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew. Uh, But for now, most of you will know Sharon from her wonderful work that she did over 20 years ago, uh, The Art of Living, which is a wonderful translation of some of Epictetus's uh, greatest teachings uh, put into a really just easy, simple to digest uh, kind of book here. And, uh, and seriously, this has been an absolute staple for me in terms of understanding the work of Epictetus. And um, she's just done a wonderful job. I'd highly recommend that anybody who uh, is interested in Epictetus grab a copy of Sharon LaBelle's book, The Art of Living. It's in the show notes with a link. Um, but yeah, she's such a wonderful person, so insightful, and I always enjoy having a conversation with her. So uh, without any further ado, I present to you my interview with Sharon LaBelle. Sharon LaBelle, I am so excited to have you here. And, and, and like I was saying before we, we started, what, before we pressed record, uh, I, I'm really excited to have you here because you're somebody who I've spoken to a couple of times now. We've sent emails back and forth. Uh, you have this uh, presence about you that it is just so beautiful and, and, it, and it, radiates, uh, it radiates a certain gratitude and joy towards life, a certain... Uh, um, not, not, not. A, I wouldn't say a silliness towards life. I would say it's, it's almost like you're, you see that life is about playing. You see that life is about ha- having uh, as much beauty and as much energy and as much joy as you can fit into your time, right? I, I really think that uh, to that point, you have embodied so much of what the Stoics essentially tried to teach us, right? And I want you to be the start of kind of a you might call it a new era in the podcast because what i've come to understand is that maybe stoicism for me my my role in stoicism isn't to keep on talking only to people within the sphere of stoicism but to continue the work that you might have say they started by asking these really important questions about what it means to live a good life and what it means to be a human because they asked all of these questions, you know, like, how do we be more effective here? How do we uh, curb our desires? And uh, after answer, ask, you know, you ask all of these questions. And in my opinion, the big question that you always have to come back to if you follow the line of questioning is, what does it actually mean to be a human being? Like, we're all here. We seem very perplexed about what it is to be human and what it means to be here in this universe, this cosmos, as the Stoics put it. And so I want to start talking to people, not just within the Stoic sphere, but people who I'm very interested to learn from, uh, who can teach me more about what it means to be a good human. And you are in the Stoic sphere, but you also, you, you have this, uh, uh, I guess this, I, I'm attracted to talking to you because I, I see you as somebody who can really teach me so much more about what it means to be an effective human being. And I've got that from the vibe that I've get, gotten from you since day one, right? You're just such a lovely person. And so uh, with that in mind, uh, I just, I want to have a good conversation with you and, and welcome you back to the podcast for the third time. And, um, you know, why don't you give us a little bit more information about who you are, what you've kind of the role you've played in stoicism in, in modern times. And then let's definitely pick up on where we left off before we started this interview, because I think that was a beautiful place to start. Wonderful. I'm thrilled to be here. And who am I and what do I have to do with Stoicism? Well, way back in the last century, circa 1997, maybe it was even 1995, I I had 
kind of experimented with all things Eastern. And I started reading ancient Western moral philosophers. And I came upon Epictetus. I couldn't pronounce his name in those days. Epictetus, Epictetus, and became enthralled with his view of the world and decided to pitch an idea to a publisher. Uh, what if I made the essential teachings of Epictetus except accessible to regular people as a kind of invitation to go deeper. And in, in, I, I can't even go back to explain the spirit of those times. The, the world I lived in then was not receptive to, uh, you know, what might be dismissed as, oh, those dead white guys, why should we listen to them? But there was just such uh, straightforward, good advice for living. And I loved that it was explained in an unsanctimonious, un thou shalt, thou shalt not way. It, it was as if Epictetus was saying, you know, do what works and quit doing what doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. And he kind of, you know, pointed pointed uh, us towards what works and what doesn't work. So anyway, uh, I'm uh, digressing a bit, but I wrote a book uh, that was a, a modern popularization of the teachings of Epictetus. And not too many people cared back then. I had a lot of explaining to do, but in time people have gotten very excited not just about Epictetus, of course, but Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, uh, the whole Stoic canon. And so that's, that's where I fit into that world. But I never like to call myself a this or a that. I, I, ideas are much more valuable than isms, mm. I think. Yeah. No, I, I, th I think that's true. And I, I actually want to delve into something that you mentioned there that I never knew, uh, which is, which can help us to probably understand why you don't necessarily like to call yourself one thing or another. Uh, I never knew that you delved a lot into Eastern philosophy. And I'd be really interested to see, do you see, I've been really getting into a lot of Alan Watts lately. And I know that he's oh, not fantastic. necessarily... He's not like, I don't know if he's necessarily the, the ultimate knowledge source of Eastern philosophy, but he obviously brings a lot of those ideas to light in a, in a way that is easily understandable. And so I, actually, I genuinely believe that listening to hours and hours of his stuff has helped me to better grasp some of the ideas that the Stoics taught. Uh, I, I really do because so much of it is based around this idea that... Uh, why are we so perplexed? I mean, like every other creature on earth, every other plant, every other thing seems to know what it does, right? And it just does it. So what was the point when we started to overthink and start to think that we actually knew everything that there was to know about how to live a good life, right? And sometimes you need to kind of just let go and understand that you're not in control. I think that there, there are echoes of that kind of idea within Stoicism. And I'd be interested to hear from you, what, what was your transition period between that Eastern philosophy and Stoicism like? Did you see similarities there? Oh, I, I mean, the similarities were like neon signs. I, I don't want to be over reductionist, mm. but I, I have, I, I've come to believe that both the Stoics and uh, different expressions of Buddhism and Hinduism and Taoism, Shintoism, they're all exhorting us to pay attention mm. and to make meaning 
and to find meaning and to see meaning, not in some conclusive way, like, oh, now I get it. Life is that, that, that. But to dare to care about the current moment that you find yourself in. Anyway, that's, that's been my takeaway. As far as, I, I mean no disrespect here, but one of the reasons why I moved away from Buddhism in particular is I was tired of sitting meditation. It, it was so valuable, but I didn't want to sit on my tush all day. Mm. I wanted to get out and, 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 and move and engage with people. And, and so I repeat, I say that with all respect to those who practice sitting meditation. This is not a screed against sitting meditation, but I was doing so much of it and I became kind of an isolationist. Mm. And I, I think life is, if you're going to find meaning any place, or if you're going to make meaning any place, it's always going to be relational. It's, it's always going to be your relationship to another person, even, even when that relationship is merely transactional, or I shouldn't even say merely. It, every time we're in relationship, that's the opportunity for the good stuff. That's what, you know, if you're of a religious cast of mind, that's where to me holiness is. That's, that's the sacred opportunity. Mm. So um, I guess I'll stop there. <laughs> no, I, <clears throat> I think there's so much, okay, there's so much that we need to talk about there because that idea that stoicism is telling us to pay attention, that's something that I have absolutely concluded or I've, I've understood since learning a lot more about Eastern philosophy. And, and after listening to enough about it, I was kind of like, wow, this is what stoicism is trying to do. It's try the, the core message. And I think that this has to do with the idea of aligning with nature as well. It's like, come home, right? Like you have a home here, like you are home Beautiful. wherever you yes. are. Right? And that's why they say yes. wherever you go, you know, you're taking yourself with you. So focus on your true home first um, and understand that you are a part of this universe just as much as the rock or the tree or the, you know, anything. Um, and, and to pay attention to, to everything. And, and since I have started seeing stoicism like that, I can tell you, Sharon, like it's been unbelievable. The, the amount of insight, the amount of uh, incredible lessons that I'm learning simply just by paying attention to life and just by, you know, and we can talk about all of this, but to your point on the meditation, I think that something that um, I've been considering, this is just an idea. Um, and we can talk about this idea of Poe later on as well, which I absolutely love that you shared with me recently, but I've been sitting with this idea uh, around what uh, Alan Watts considers to be the sly man, right? So uh, he taught that um, you know, in Eastern philosophy, you kind of, you have the guru who is somebody who sits and meditates and spends their whole time in deep thought, you know, like very secluded from the world might go into nature. And then, and I'm, but I'm going to butcher all of this, but this is a, my best understanding. And then he said that you have the yogi who is all focused on discipline. Discipline is the way to enlightenment. And so you, you focus on the skill and you, you master the skill but then he says you have the sly man who is somebody who recognizes that to seclude yourself from society is not to be human and to focus all of your energy on discipline is also not to be human, but to simply be, and to simply, uh, to have faults, right. To, to, <laughs> to, yeah, you're not perfect and you never will be. And as soon as you understand that, then you can release all of your desires to be anything other than what you are living where you are. Right. And I actually think that stoicism in many ways could be the Western culture version of the sly man, the person who understands that if I have money, excellent. If I don't have it, that's okay. I don't need to desire, but I also don't need to desire not to desire. I just need to be here and recognize that this is my home and I need to 
be as effective as a human being as I can within the structures that I live in, right? Do you think that there's any valid validity in that, that sort of, I, I don't know, picture of stoicism? All I can say is, amen, brother. <laughs> I second the motion. Yes. And italicized yes. A bold face yes. I can't say that any better <laughs> than you've just said it. I think, I think well, well, let's jump into something really interesting that you said to me then, right? Which is, has actually helped me so much. I, I'm a very passionate person. And when I think of an idea, I jump at it, right? I, and and, and I, I, I get very excited about things. You sent me an email outlining uh, this article that you wrote um, about, I believe it was an Eastern idea, the idea of Po, which, which essentially means to sit with an idea. Can you, can you like talk to me more about how you see that idea and how it helps you to think about life and to, to think about, you know, being, I don't know who you are, where you are. <laughs> Definitely. Well, first I should give proper uh, attribution. So the notion of Poe was, uh, it came from, a wonderful thinker whom some of your read, uh, listeners may know about named Edward de Bono. And he's a Maltese polymath. He has just spent his life writing about behavior and the human condition and what makes us happy. He writes about uh, whatever is on his mind. And I recommend all of his books. But he came up with this wonderful notion that he called Poe. And it does indeed sound Eastern. Poe, P-O, means not yes, not no. It simply means to consider an idea, a circumstance, the moment you find yourself rooted in, in such a way that you're not pushing it away, you know, you know, deciding, no, 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 that's not for me, or yes, I'm on board. And simply, well, we're circling back to paying attention mm. to what is under consideration. And I can't say enough about this notion. Well, one of the ways that um, Mr. De Bono explains it is that the way you get a handle on this idea of Poe is it, it appears, for example, in the word poem or possibility or posit or suppose. Mm. He, gi he gives many other examples. I'm, I'm not that fresh. Uh, I haven't read him in decades, but the, the idea is that it's more like you're pointing to an idea than grasping it, or, forgive the big word, you're not trying to disambiguate something, that, which is our, our brains are like disambiguation machines. We want to not only judge things, do we like them or do we not like them? Do we believe in them or do we not believe in them? But we, we always just want to sort of conclusively label something so that we can move on. And, it, you know, that makes sense because, it, you know, in order to get from here to there at some point, you know, you have to, <laughs> you have to make value decisions, you have to make definitional decisions, and so on. But I, we still need, I think, to have a love affair with Poe, because Poe po is what takes us home in the sense that you described it a couple minutes ago. It's it's that frame of mind where you're not trying to exert your will 
on life. You're not lying paws up. It, it, it's not defeat. But you're in harmony with nature, as our friendly <laughs> Stoics would say. I hope that made sense. Um, yeah. I, to me, it, seem, it seems like it's almost uh, as soon as you label something one way or the other and as soon as you place a certain judgment on it that's what it is right and your mind doesn't have to continue thinking about it right like it's just like cool that's what it is brilliant now i can put that away in a box and not think about it right right and you've thereby foregone an opportunity to have gone in some kind of extraordinary direction yeah yeah no, I see that. I see that. And I think it's, um, damn, that can be so helpful. And, and I, I almost feel like since I, I took this step to kind of, to leave my job and to focus on stoicism as much as I could and focus on the things that I'm very interested in, I, I almost feel like I'm in a, a everlasting state of confusion about this world. Right. And, it, and I don't necessarily think it's confusion. I think it might be more like, sitting with the idea when you sit with the idea that maybe you don't understand everything and maybe uh all of this is far beyond your understanding uh welcome to the land of poe you've arrived (laughs) welcome to the land of poe right (laughs) and it's like when you sit with something and you say i don't understand this and i may never understand it but i'll at least see what it has to teach me uh, yes, I really think that you start to ask better questions. I think you start to get better answers, you know, if you can get answers, but it's like, if you look at the world that we live in and you just sit with, and you don't put judgments on, you know, this is good, this is bad, this is what it is, but you just sit with it and try to experience what, what everything is. It's almost like you step outside of yourself, right? And you become a spectator as opposed to a player. And then you can see what's going on, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I I think what people often don't realize is it's actually safe to be in that frame of mind that they won't uh lose all hold on reality or or that their ambitions won't be fulfilled or something. There's tremendous power in just, in a sense, just letting go of the rope and letting life be what it actually is. And it's not that dangerous. Yeah. You know, it, it's like we're so scared that if, if we're not all tensed up and trying to figure out exactly what is happening or what this is, Everything's kind of fine. We're okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and the thing is, and that's a brilliant point, right? And, and, and Marcus Aurelius talks about this all the time. So many people in ancient religions and philosophies, the Bible talks about it. Easter philosophy talks about it. Stoicism talks about it. This idea that, listen, there are many, 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 many generations before you who all survived and got through this thing called life. And you've been surviving for however many years you've been alive. Yesterday you survived. Today you'll probably survive. And tomorrow you will face the day with the same amount of reasoning power and the same powers that you have as a human being. Like life will never throw something your way that you can't handle. And if it does, then you're dead and you don't have to think about it anymore. Right? Like, right. Problem solved. That, that's it. Right. And it's an ancient yeah. idea that's been taught in so many different places that you kind of have to just accept it and say, okay, I get it. And I got to say, Sharon, I had this really conversation with um, one of my, uh, my beautiful musician mentors, Paul, uh, the other day. And I kind of said to him, I was like, Paul, do you realize that we literally don't have to do or be anything? Do you realize that when you're born into this world, <laughs> who, who told you that this is what this is and this is what that is? Or, or that you're supposed to do this or that you're supposed to do that. And, and yet we all have this really clear idea of this is what's right. This is what's wrong. This is what we need to do. This is the way to live a good life. When literally like 
that's just stuff that we've been told. I mean, there's, there's so much out there to explore. Why would you limit yourself and say that I have to be anything, right? Yes. <laughs> we could just be. <laughs> we could, we're, we're, going, we're going into way, we're going into yes. a far out tangent. What do you know? We're, we're far out here, I tell you what. <laughs> we're gonna solve all of the world's issues in one conversation, Sharon, I can tell you that. But I, I think, um, Honestly, what I've been really interested in lately is this idea of, uh, of going back to the most fundamental bed essentials of what it means to be a human being. And yes. something that Alan Watts said, I keep on coming back to him. You know, if this was two months ago, I would have been talking about Jordan Peterson. If it was two months before that, I would have been talking about Gary Vaynerchuk. I, I, I tend to cling to people, listen to as much as possible, and then move on to the next person and see what I can get. But something that he said, he was saying, like, if you look at a mountain, and you put your labels on it, right? The only reason we call it a mountain and we see what it is, is because we have these words that we created that uh, can show us a certain interpretation of what there is. Take every single word out of everything that you think, right? And all that you're looking at is, is, is existence. It's not even that, it's, it's an expression of nature, right? Like that's all that there is. There's, there's no mountain, there's no animals, there's no trees. It's just you and whatever this is, right? And yes. that's, that's one of the most fundamental questions that we all try to answer. But in trying to answer that, do you think that we go too far and put too much on it that it becomes way too compu- complicated? It, you mean once we start labeling things? Well, yeah, once. Or, well, yeah, once we. So we have these words, and and we have this ability to label everything and to find meaning in everything, and which is beautiful. It's a natural human virtue, right? But at what point do you think it becomes too much, where we try to overcomplicate things that are really quite simple? Yes. Um, how easy we can be blinded by our irrepressible meaning making minds. I, I, I think what's so important, well, I guess you alluded to this in earlier in the conversation is that idea of getting back to basics. Uh, what does it mean to be a human being? What it, what is a good person? What is, or, or or if you want to put it in the language of of stoicism, you know, you know, if you go with your magnifying glass out into the field, how do you know when you've happened upon a stoic or an as, aspiring stoic? What what does that person look like? What are they doing or refraining from doing? I like questions like that. Mm. Actually, I want to answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> as an, at, not as a definitive or only answer, but I, I, I've been asking myself, well, what it, what's a good person? I, you know, what is a good person and what is their value not only to themselves or to, uh, to their community, to society, to the world? Mm. And I, one of the things I keep thinking about is how, a, kind of how much our society worships idols. I, and I don't mean that in some biblical sense, but that we're always seeking superlatives in our heroes and in our, our ideals, even in the spiritual realm. You know, everyone loves, as you mentioned, the guru, the yogi, the some kind of superstar expression of being Hmm. a human being. But I believe that a good stoic or a good anybody looks like everybody else and that they are simply a regular person who is inclining towards being surpassingly decent hmm. and, 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 and simply honorable. 
you know, what we might call virtuous, though people find that to be a pretty heavy handed word. I, I believe that these are the people we need to hold up are, these are the pillars of life. You know, thank goodness there have been Mother Teresa's and Gandhi's and fill in the blank. But it's really the unsung people who just do things like keep their word in ordinary human transactions, uh, who just show up and do what needs to be done. And that's that's the the web that's our social contract and and the web of um human trust that sustains us as individuals and as as a world and you know arguably that 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 net or that web is it's getting pretty frayed right now but I do believe it's going to be just the ordinary people who hew to their own definition of goodness and mm. don't run around, you know, getting on top of a soapbox and telling other people what a good person is, but simply when someone's hungry, give them a sandwich. When Just do what's needed and somehow i think that will be salvific for all of us but that's yeah. just my idiot faith no <laughs> that's that's such a such a great great place to go to in this concert i want to continue this because if you think about it yeah there's these people that we all look up to it's important that we aim right like we're, we're aiming creatures and we're always aiming at something and there's a real beauty in the fact that we pick somebody based on these definitions of what we think is good and we say that's what i'd like to be at and we actually have the ability to move towards that right but yes. when it comes down to it is there anything really more effective for progressing humanity than somebody who offers a kind word or offers some encouragement or offers to help when you're in need or or shows an example of just pure charity not after any sort of acclaim not after any sort of thanks but simply just because they are being a good person right i don't think there's anything more effective for a society than somebody who is close to you showing you an example of just being a good person right right and it's because it, it's close to you because it's close to you and of course but but being close to you it then has a transformative effect on you, yeah. which in turn radiates into all of all people and situations that you trust. So that's where the power lies in just ordinary people electing in any given moment to simply do the right thing without fireworks, without fanfare. It's a very gratifying way to live, I think, too. And and we know this, right? Like we, we know because if you go to a mechanic and the mechanic tells you, I can do this job for you, it's going to cost you this much. And then when you get your car back, it's running so much better. You pay the amount that they said, you can trust that mechanic and you've had a really good interaction with that person. That is the very fabric, that interaction of trust. I trust that you're really good at what you do and you're not going to screw me over. And you right. trust that I'm going to give you enough value that would make you thrilled to do this job. That's the, that's the trust that holds everything together. And it doesn't happen at the highest level. It happens on no. the everyday level between you and every single person that you deal with, right? Yeah, which is why every moment counts hmm. and what we do even though we might not be people who other people seek our autograph we're the ones that matter our, our choices to do or not do to say or not say to think or not think yeah Absolutely. I love that. And I want to ask you, who, 
inspires you? Who, who in your life have, have, who are these people who have set examples to you of what it means to be trustworthy, to be virtuous and who do you aim at? You know, it's really tough to answer that. Um, I, I, I mean, the back of my mind will keep thinking about that because I want to give a sincere answer. Hmm. But honestly, and I don't mean this in any spirit of cynicism, I have known many outwardly great people, you know, thought leaders, I, especially because I used to work in book publishing. And I used to work with people who uh, either, they had celebrity in one way or another because of their gifts, be they um, spiritual, psychological, what, um, great teachers, whatever. But a lot of times I got to see their underwear drawer and um, it was very disillusioning at first to find out that people, we really contain multitudes. Uh, even, you know, the best, we so want people to be untarnished and perfect so they can be our heroes. But we're all kind of jerks, and but we're also angels. And so I, I don't mean to evade your question, but kind, I don't because sad, I, I don't really have any heroes. I, I, it, I, I will see good moments. I will see people uh, making beauty, say through art, and I'll be deeply affected. But I know that that, that same person who just, uh, you know, affected me that deeply could also be, you know, a philandering cad. <laughs> And, yep. and we, so I, I guess, I don't know, I, I, I like to think I'm a realist and not a cynic, but I, I'm really scared of, of having heroes. I, certainly there have been books I've read by people and I deeply admire them, but uh, I hope I'm not failing at this question. No, I, I think I, you're doing, yeah. I, I think, I think what you're trying to say is that, that what matters is the moments that we see goodness, right. And you need to capture those moments. That's and it. I think of Marcus Aurelius uh, because I mean, his whole first book in his meditations was dedicated to pointing out the characteristics and lessons that he learned from beautiful people in his life. Now, what he didn't say was this person's perfect, that person's perfect, that person's perfect. What he said was from this person, I learned this and this from that yes. person. I learned that and that. Right. Yeah. And to, together with all of those people and all those lessons that he learned, he put together what I call his personal ideal. Like this is the, this is the person who he would have absolutely loved to have been uh, and worked towards. That's not necessarily based on one hero, it's based on many different characteristics from beautiful people in his life that he can bring together and hopefully embody those. And yeah, I, I think it's just something that some people are drawn to have those specific heroes. And, and I, I see that as myself, like personally, I, I get a lot of value out of picking somebody and saying, okay, cool. I really want to be like that person, but there's also the, the understanding that, you know, some of the most brilliant minds of history also had the biggest flaws, right? It almost comes right. with the territory. That, it almost comes with the territory. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and, yeah. and that's, that's one of the interesting things about life is you see these, these people who create the most incredible pieces of art or the most uh, amazing businesses, or, you know, they become the top of their game in whatever they're doing. And, uh, you kind of just have to accept that these people, as much as they're awesome, they're also just regular people just like you. And they deal with same, the same kind of issues that you deal with. And so don't put them on a pedestal, but understand what you can learn from them, you know? Yeah. I think it yeah. makes us more compassionate too, to, yeah. to have that. 
perspective and but see, definitely sorry go no on. please go ahead now you well, well i think i think that that's a really important point it's like we place so much judgment on everybody in society uh, often incredibly high amounts of judgment of people at the top as well, which is important because, you know, while they're there in the light, they should probably be trying to be the best examples of what good humanity is. Right. Yes. But, you know, you can kind of get lost just sitting there thinking about all of the bad things that other people do and not spend so much time thinking about how that relates to you as well. Like we are all deeply flawed in one way or the other. And to think that, that you're the only one dealing with certain trials or you're the only one who uh, ought to think that you're perfect. Like, no, every single person has something that they're dealing with on a deep level that you yes. can't see, you can't understand. And this might be, I really want to bring you back into where we started at the start of this conversation that we didn't get to record, but talking about the idea of, being received as well as receiving and and being with a person and 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 not having that sort of judgment can you talk about that like like the art of of understanding you might call it yes uh, well the art of understanding i think it springs forth from listening listening to another person on, on their terms and, and receiving what, what it is they're trying to get across. It, it matters so much to people to feel heard, to feel seen, and to feel received. We know this, but we have to remember this, I think, over and over again, because, I mean, so often we're all just kind of living in this stupor of trying to maximize our comfort and minimize our discomfort <laughs> that, we, we overlook what, what is most important, which is, again, circling back, the opportunity of this moment. And the opportunity of this moment comes in relation to the other people that we're mm. dealing with. And, and the quality of attention we bring to them and to the possibilities that in here, in any circumstance. Mm. Yeah. I, I, the good and, possibilities. And, and you might say that the, the understanding has to start with, with you understanding that the self can exist, can not exist without the other, right? You cannot be here Bingo. unless you have the other person, right? Right. And this is, this is essentially what I see is happening all around the world at the moment. I kind of call it an assault on middle ground. Like, like what's happening is there is no middle ground anymore. We're unable Help to come to a conversation that. and, and, and we're, when we're unable to, to come to a conversation, understanding that there are very real reasons why you would feel the way you feel. There are very real reasons why I would feel the way I feel. And, and what you see is, all of a sudden you've got people on the right who say, you know, if you're on the left, you're an absolute idiot. And, and, you know, and, and there's people on the left who say, you know, I don't want to speak to anyone on the right. Cause obviously you're an absolute uh, Trump supporter, idiot, loser, like whatever it is like that. And, yeah. and so you, 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 it's, it's a very inhuman belief that things are all one way and that you have everything right. And that's absolutely never the case, right? It's never the case. And it's not even that satisfying to be right. It's just kind of a cheap thrill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, such a, that's such a great insight. 
It's so true. <laughs> it's so true. Try it's like, being right. Yeah. 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 But as soon as you do that, as soon as you're like, you know what? I am right. And you know, you, you kind of shut the other side down. You don't feel great about that. Like, no, you're you feel, lonely. Yeah. You're lonely. If, but how, if just, how easy is it? How easy is it to change when you know that the other person has heard you, right? When you know that the other person yes. has, as you said, received you, all the barriers go down. Everything shuts down and you are open to having that conversation. That's why for me, literally the only thing that, that would uh, make me not want to have a conversation with someone is if they come to the conversation saying, I have all the answers and if you think this, then I don't want to talk to you, right? And that's kind of like, it's kind of like a paradox because I'm doing the exact same thing, right? I'm, I'm coming to the conversation saying, there's a prerequisite here, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you can't win. You absolutely can't win. But, but I think it's a beautiful thing to consider that there needs to be a common ground and that all starts with receiving what the other person has to say and putting yourself in their perspective, right? Yes, and that's something over which we do have control. Yeah, yeah. We just I mean, don't just, practice it often enough. We don't practice it often enough. But there's every single moment, there's the opportunity to make that pivot in that direction. And that's where all the power is, in that little pivot, which is elective. I mean, nobody's holding a gun to our head and telling us that we have to be rigid and shut down and um, uh, lacking a kind of uh, emotional porousness. Is that a word? You know, porous. Yeah. 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 We'll go with it. We'll go with it. <laughs> I'd love to make up new words. <laughs> We'll look it up afterwards. I just won't right. ask you in Scrabble ever because you'll just be cheating the whole time. But uh, no, I, I, lo I, I love this kind of conversation because honestly, it is, it's, it's so sad to see, you know, and I say this with a full understanding that I've done this so many times, right? So it's like, it's, it's sad to see and also to be in the situation where there cannot be an understanding of the middle ground that, that, yeah. And it's interesting because there's a necessity for, as we go back to, it's like there cannot be the self without the other. There cannot be the left without the right. There cannot be this country without that country. You know, there, can, there cannot be anything without something that opposes it. That's one of the universal laws of nature, right? And, and when you understand that, then you can look at life and you can align with that a more fatty kind of outlook on life that the Stoics have of love your fate because you understand that, there's going to be good things that happen to you. There's going to be bad things that are going to happen to you. And the good needs the bad and the bad needs the good. As much as there are going to be good people, there's going to be bad people. The good need the bad because otherwise we don't even understand what it means to be good. And, right. and it's just such a, it's such an interesting place that we're in at the moment, right? It's such an interesting place to see what's happening in the world and the division. And it's so inhuman yeah isn't that funny it's so inhuman but this these are unprecedented times uh maybe it's arrogant to think that but I, well i'm just thinking about what's going on with people in the coronavirus uh my community has been completely changed by this nobody's going anywhere all events have been canceled universities are closed and people are terrified and i think this is the best moment of all because our principles are only as valuable as when they are applied in in challenging times in during the key clutch moments, right? Yeah. And so we get to we get to test ourselves and we we get to 
reach for our better natures. And hopefully that, that effort, that approximation um, becomes contagious rather than fear. Yeah. It, it really, it really is a time when we're seeing the madness of crowds, just like, you know, we've, yes. we've learned from history, right? It's like, if you can step outside and be a spectator for a moment, what you will see is exactly what the Stoics talked about when they said, watch out for the crowd. For example, in Australia, it yeah, seems, please tell. <laughs> it would seem that the only thing that Australians think are important right now is toilet paper. Uh, because <laughs> <laughs> there is an insane effort to get every bit of toilet paper that is available in our stores over here. People yes. are fighting. There's YouTube videos of people just screaming and fighting at each other in stores, trying to get the last toilet paper. And somebody's walking out with a trolley full of toilet paper rolls. And I'm like, what is happening here? What, <laughs> what is this? I mean, you look at that, you can step outside and be a spectator and, and, and understand that this is just what humanity is. We are absolute tribal creatures. We are a herd mentality. And if you look at history, that's what we've always been. We've always been this very, in this very reactionary state. And I really think that that comes down to a certain level of overthinking about life, a certain level of, uh, you know, here's the stimulus and without even thinking, we know what it means or we think we right. know what it means. And so how do you, you know, what's, what's, I'm trying to figure out what's the process to, and I think Stoicism goes a long way. I think a lot of religions and sorry, not that Stoicism is a religion, it's a philosophy, but a lot of religions and philosophies go a long way to helping us to get to this stage. But what's the process of getting your mind outside of that, group mentality and into a spectator state where you can see things for what they actually are. Like how, how have you done that? What's been the biggest benefit to you? Humor and, and beauty. Yeah. Humor. Um, humor. I think it, when we lose our sense of humor, we lose our dignity as human beings. And as for beauty, I mean just the making of music or the making of art or, or just this, the act of simply noticing the colors or the shadows on the leaves outside. I, I, well, that's what puts my head back on straight. I, I, I don't, know how else to say it yeah um, th i mean and those are my sanity savers <laughs> yeah no that, that's so beautiful and and i have to talk to you about this sharon and i ha i have to have this conversation because marcus aurelius talks so many times in his meditations about you know he'll look at like a loaf of bread and how exquisite is it that the cracks form in the top of the bread and like you know this is just how it's formed there's there's nothing that it doesn't mean anything, but it's how it is and it's beautiful. And uh, something that I've experienced lately as I have uh, gone deeper into this journey around stoicism, trying to figure out what it means to align with nature, what it means to, uh, you know, see these ancient ideas that can teach us about life. It's like, I've absolutely fallen back in love with culture and with the beauty that can be found within nature and so it's even it's it's so hard for me to go on a trail run now because every 500, 500 meters i'll just stop and start taking a photo of a leaf you know yes <laughs> yes and, and 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 i've got this this um this kind of album on my phone called small details and it's basically photos that i've taken of tiny little things in nature that are just if you stop and you look at it it's absolutely exquisite right and I think yes. that that's what, what these ancient philosophies are trying to call us back to. It's, it's coming back to that place where you can actually see the whole picture for what it is, which is absolutely exquisite. And you can do that by either going as far back as possible, like the view from above technique that Marcus Aurelius said, or you can do that or by going as close down close as possible. Close down right? as, yes, yeah. yes. 
Boy, I'd love to see that album sometime. Yeah. <laughs> Tru I'll, I'll have... Truly. Yeah, Truly. well, I'll share that with you, absolutely. But um, there's some fascinating things. Even there, the other day I was running and I found these beautiful little spider webs that just look yes. like chandeliers and so exquisite, so perfectly made. And if you, if I took a picture close up of the web and the web is perfectly in line, tiny little microscopic squares, just absolutely perfect all the way around the chandelier that's holding all of these shiny dew drops, right? And you look at this and you think, I actually put this in a post on my Instagram. I said like, these spiders literally just get up every day and create this absolute masterpiece. They don't yes. think about it. They just know how to do it and they do it. What makes you think that you as a human being with all of your neural capacity, with all of your mind and your thinking, your rationality, what makes you think that you aren't also in the process of, or, or at least have the ability to be in the process of creating something beautiful with your day? and exquisite like what's what's your excuse right right if, if this tiny little <laughs> spider like if this tiny little spider just gets up every day and creates this exquisite masterpiece like yes. why are we so confused about why we're here it's it's such a it's such a yeah it's such an interesting time to be alive because we have so much information and there's so much to process but how much of it is necessary i guess that's the question what's real and what's not what's necessary and what's not but talk yes. to me about culture. I want to hear about culture from you because you play the, is it the dulcimer? Is, is yes, it, yeah. I, I play, um, well, I call it a dulcimer. It's, it's really a one of a kind thing because yeah. I had this guy make it for me, but it's based on a hammer dulcimer and has uh, five octaves, fully chromatic. And it's, um, It, it when I was young, it just when I saw a smaller version of this instrument, it it beeped at me. It just it it was like this instant vocation in, in the truest sense of that word, a calling that attention, Sharon LaBelle, you must do right by this instrument and liberate its beauty get going and and there's nothing grand I, I i mean it's not for myself it's not it's I, i'm duty bound to uh, i'm like that spider I, I mean we're all like that spider if if we would but listen to these callings that we get from life but that relates to what you just said simon that we are so besieged with information that our job most of the time is 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 what i would call the big sort you know putting uh, okay that's trivial that's trivial that's evil that's evil this is good this is important and and we're kind of exhausted by the big sort but if we can just listen i mean i don't want to sound like a crackpot but i just believe that life speaks if we can turn down the volume on the junk uh or, mm. or just the uh the secondary the tertiary that i i i'm not sure i answered your question you said what you about definitely culture? did no can, continue with your thinking because i i i that idea of the instrument speaking to you and saying, liberate my beauty, you know, like dedicate yourself to me uh, is something that I think a lot of musicians experience. And, and I think music and art is one of those things that has to be, uh, that's why we call it an outlet, right? It's like you're letting out something within you that is able to, and this way, this speaks to something that's more human than almost anything, right? It's our ability to take basic raw elements and turn them into something that is absolutely exquisite, right? We are creators. Yes. That's what we are. We, we are. need that outlet to, to be able to use our hands and our minds to, to make something that you could even say mimics nature, mimics the beauty that we see within nature. Uh, and, and 
all that art and music and all of these beautiful things in culture are is it's a representation of the culture that we see around us, the world that we see around us. Right. Yes. And so what's the experience for you like, because the Stoics really, they didn't have a great affinity towards culture and music, right? It, it wasn't necessarily right. something that they thought about a lot, but you see something like I had a conversation with, um, with a, a wonderful uh, philosopher, Peter from, from uh, Poland yesterday. And we discussed the idea that, um, you know, Christianity, one of the reasons why it may have been so successful is because it embraced culture, it really embraced music and, and, and art and, and exquisite architecture. And all of these things were important because they are expressions of our divine power to create and bring something into being that didn't exist beforehand. Right. So what's the experience like for you with, with, with music and culture and like, what does it bring you is what I would ask my 10 minute question. <laughs> yeah. Um, it brings me a, a, a place in the world. It, it justifies my existence. It doesn't exalt me, but it gives me my job, my marching orders. And Frankly, I think any time we have an idea that goes through our minds, it's, it, obviously we can't act on any idea that flies through our heads. But there are certain ideas that are a little more sticky, right? They keep returning, uh, or you know, maybe they change in form a little bit, but they keep saying, hey, you, hey, you, hey, you. And I don't know, I just believe we have a duty to uh to realize those ideas to 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 make the spider web i because no one else can do it it's like the idea the notion chose us to bring it into being and uh let's see let me circle back to your question though you know what does it do for me i I, yeah, like I say, it just tells me where, which seat to sit in, in the theater of life, you know, oh, you're in row three, three K, that's your seat. And if everyone will just sit down in their seat and do what they're supposed to do, then this big machine will hum like a butte. <laughs> Uh, Forgive me way, if I'm getting too abstract. I, no, I, that's I, way I, too yeah. powerful for me. Hey, I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling <laughs> here because that's that's something that I've been really thinking about lately. It's this idea of what if everybody just decided to listen to the things that they were really drawn to. You know, like yes. for me, from a young age, I was drawn to music and particularly jazz. I was very talented in jazz. And I haven't developed that skill to the best of my abilities because I leaned upon my talent as opposed to realizing that this is, no, this is a duty that you have now to it's a respect duty. this instrument and to bring forth your talent within this instrument or your voice. And, and you see this with people who, for example, master the English language, somebody who can get up there on stage and can make you see something that you, or feel something you couldn't feel before simply by choosing the correct uh, code of words, right? Right. And what is more powerful than somebody who's mastered an instrument and is standing up on stage and showing you that they have spent their entire life dedicated to bringing, like embodying everything that this instrument could be if they actually spent the time, right? And there are people out there who are absolutely made to be the absolute best mechanic that they could be. There are people who are right. supposed to be the best doctor. And even with money, I've been playing with this idea that you look at people like Warren Buffett. He's good at what he does because he can't do anything else. That's what he's right. drawn to. He right. loves that's making money. He loves investing. <laughs> that's it. That's his web. That's right? his spider web. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is the idea that I really think is important about aligning with nature. It's like, what is your nature? Listen, stop for a second, pause all this. What's your seat? And I think you 
portrayed it perfectly there. It's like, if we all sit down in the theater of life and we, we understand and we're able to stop thinking about everybody else's mission and start just listening to what we are drawn to, what would the world look like if everybody just did the thing that they were drawn to do? Right. I, to I me, don't... that's what <laughs> virtue is. You know, yeah. sometimes people say, well, what's, what's virtue? What's goodness? I think it's heeding the call, heeding those calls. Yeah. And it, and it's, it's not about yourself. It, it's, a, it's about what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> yeah. And, and don't people say that? How many people do you hear saying that where they get to a certain level of success in whatever they're doing and they say, well, you know, this is no longer about me. This is so much more important than me. This is uh, something is driving me. And often that is represented in people's belief. You might say it's like, Hey, something's driving me. I don't know what it is. I, I can't really explain it, but let's just call it God or let's call it Muhammad or let's call it this or that, or let's call it nature. Let's call it, uh, you know, whatever it is, a divine intelligence. And I don't want to go too far into that because people can get turned off, but I think that there's something really important in that, right? There's something important in that, that place that you get to where you realize that, this is all far, far bigger and far more out of my control than what I had previously thought, right? You speak the truth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I hope so. Yes. It's really big. Yeah. It's re really complicated. Yeah. But all you have to do is take your seat and do what you have to do. <laughs> or well, jump on stage and start playing. Or jump right? on stage. <laughs> Yeah, what, whatever it is, whatever the moment calls for. Yeah. Whatever the moment calls for. And maybe to circle back, I mean, this, this brings us back to the idea that we should be able to understand that we have our own unique nature. Somebody else doesn't fit with that, and that's perfect, right? Because everybody yeah, has goodness. to have some sort of place. Thank, yeah, thank goodness yeah, that thank not goodness. everybody is. And... And there's a real, there's a real push for people to be something other than what they actually are these days. You know, you see so many people going to university, picking degrees that they're not really interested in, but their mom told them, oh, you should probably be an accountant because that's probably going to get you a good job after university and great. And, or you yes. should probably do this or that. But everybody comes to a point in their lives where they start to think, you know, what could I have been? if I had just followed the things that I was really interested in and yeah. I'd... Okay. This is my last question to you. How do you, how do you quiet the voice and, and, and how do you listen? If you've never really listened to that before, how do you recognize when there's a moment where you should probably be drawn in, in that direction? How do you recognize that? I don't want to call it a voice, but you know, yeah. whatever it is. Well, I guess, I, uh, uh, well, I, I hear that voice audibly when I make it a habit to settle my mind. And my particular idiosyncratic ways of settling my mind are um, I go out my door and hike. I, I have the good fortune of living in a fairly rural area and I can just step out and walk for 13 miles and amidst redwoods. I realize that's a luxury. But that's one thing I do. And the other thing I do is I have a, a daily yoga practice, which somehow... Um, uh, it just makes makes my jabber mind shut up and allows the important fundamental um, I don't know in, injunctions or to to uh, to surface. Now I'm not prescribing hikes or yoga to anyone. We all have our are different ways of 
uh, calming the busy mind so mm. that the good stuff, the real stuff can come true. But I guess I, I would urge, again, I'm not being prescriptive in any way, but I think it's just so valuable to find out what allows you to let go and to listen. I, I don't know how else to say it. Well, I, Sharon, I think you have a, an incredible ability to say so much by almost saying as little as possible, right? Like, yeah, I, I feel like, I feel like, I feel like if we just sat here for an hour and said nothing, all of us would understand the answers to the universe just by being around you. So, <laughs> I Back yeah, at you. <laughs> <laughs> I want, yeah, I want to thank you again. Um, you know, this. I, I hope that we can have many, many, uh, you know, informal just conversations uh, on this show, and um, you know. It, because I think that you understand people and life on a level that so many people can resonate with, including myself. This has been beautiful. And uh, I thank you. I thank you again. Oh gosh. Thank you. This has just <laughs> been terrific. All right. So there you have it. My interview with Sharon LaBelle. Now I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Sharon is always so insightful, so friendly, uh, and just offers the best advice. And so it's always great to have a conversation with her and we're going to have her back on many more times. But uh, in the meantime, make sure you grab her book, The Art of Living, uh, an absolute classic in the Stoic community. Uh, and I'll talk to you in the next episode. But until then, I hope that this episode has helped you on your rise to the good life. Ciao. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date with the Practical Stoic community and everything to do with this podcast, then just go to my website, simonjedrew.com and subscribe to the Practical Stoic Weekly, a newsletter that I send out every week with updates and all sorts of great Stoic insights. You can also find me everywhere online by searching Simon J.E. Drew. See you next time.